Uh, hi everyone, this is uh, Vincent here. Uh, today we are going to discuss our involvement in a project called Open Source Climate and in particular we'll be covering uh, how we help uh, building a climate related data platform using open source technology uh, and a data mesh architecture approach. So in this agenda we'll spend a bit of time uh, to go through the context, what, what problem we are actually trying to solve and also why open source as an approach to solving climate data issue uh, and of course the the focus of the presentation is going to be on the platform architecture, try to explain how we are approaching the climate data problem and why it's a novel approach uh, to do so. Uh, and Eric will spend a fair bit of time uh, you know, showing with some demo uh, some of the platform capabilities. So first, uh, I actually work in the in financial services team and quite often I'm asked the question, why is financial services critical to uh, the climate issue? Uh, I'm just back from Glasgow, where the 26th climate conference happened uh, you know, in the past two weeks. And actually one big change, an important change in the way the climate problem is now being uh, uh, approached is the involvement of the corporate sector into the resolution of the climate problem. So if you think about it, what's the way for us to transition to a net zero a carbon emission pathway? It's really to motivate and encourage corporations to all make effort uh, towards this direction. And if you start thinking about it, uh, financial sector and in particular the banking sector uh, being responsible for about 90 plus percent of financing to corporation is actually extremely important to finance the net zero pathway. So what's interesting is for financial institution, climate in itself is actually a challenge, an important challenge, because investment that these institutions are making uh, translate to potentially climate risk. Let's say you are financing uh, you know, energy production uh, and you start to lend money for the next 25 to 30 years, it becomes extremely important to understand how climate risk could affect the business that you are investing in, and obviously their ability to service the loan that you are making. Uh, and that means being able to understand uh, you know, financial risk in terms of climate driver from the, the, the physical risk point of view. Uh, so what happens if an extreme climate event uh, a tornado, or if slowly uh, rising could actually endanger a physical asset that the company you are investing in uh, actually possesses. So, the financial institute attention to try to model uh, climate risk to secure their own investment. And in addition to this, we have now regulator but realize that the public sector itself is not going to be on its own, able to really drive very significant climate change and requires the help of the private sector. And financial institutions are very key to this because they are the main financing institution. In addition to this, all of us as investors, we are increasingly aware of what climate represents as a risk to our planet. And obviously, we are also starting to put pressure on financial institutions to disclose the nature of their investment and make sure they invest in green business. So now let's look at OS Climate. The, the purpose of OS Climate in the grand scheme of things is to help the corporate sector as well as the financial sector to have an open collaboration opportunity around one main uh, challenge in modeling climate risk which is about acquiring data. And for this, there are really three main tenets uh, to, to really be this approach. Uh, the first one is, in the past, a lot of financial institutions uh, or any sort of NGO or non-for-profit that work in the field of climate data tend to try to solve problems on their own. We believe that using an open source approach and an open source community 
to actually collaborate, so to have multiple stakeholders invest their intellectual property and share the cost and burden uh, is actually a more efficient alternative. And with this open source approach, we basically look at building mainly two capabilities. One is the global data commons, which is a curated library of public and private data for climate, which is what we are going to cover today. And also helping institutions to build scenario analytics uh, uh, across the different you know, climate dimensions. Why is it important to adopt a community-based open source approach? Is mostly because we want to be efficient at solving problems and share the solution, uh, and obviously try to solve the climate data problem faster if everybody is kind of pulling the rope in the same direction. Uh, running this open source means we have a shared and structured governance around the project, so the key industry player can agree on what main data challenge they have and what is the focus of this engagement. We also create a very high trust collaboration structure between players. This includes some commercial data players who are actually sharing their data on a kind of what we call pre-competitive basis, which means that they share the data with us to be able to train a new uh, uh, you know, data models and analytics model uh, and then spread them across the industry. And of course, from a licensing point of view, open source is code and, and uh, platform design across the community. Now let's focus on the climate data challenges. There are mainly three main challenges that we are trying to solve. The first one is about data availability. Uh, interestingly, there are really two challenges here. One is there's actually a huge volume of data that is generated by the industry. Uh, and the data is extremely distributed. So it's very hard to actually connect data to each other. At the same time, although data volume is high, certain regions or certain industry have a lot of either insufficient granularity or limited coverage. So there can be missing data. So one example is you could have public utility disclosing uh, energy production and CO2 emission for energy provider in United States, but there is no such data available for China. So you may be missing some geographic or industry data. Now, even if you have the data, another problem is because it's distributed, it's extremely hard to compare across different sources because they may not follow the same disclosure standard or they may not follow the same data format. And last but not least, uh, another problem is data reliability. As you feed the data through this model, you want to make sure that you understand how the data has been produced. So one issue typically is, uh, there are a lot of community out there that build their own model, generate data, but nobody is able to understand transparently how the data that has been generated could be trusted. So let's move now to the architecture. So the idea is we have an extremely high number of potential data providers, and we want to help by building a platform that solve this problem of data availability, comparability, and reliability. For data availability, our approach is to use a self-service data management platform. So what we are doing really is to make a collection of well-integrated, standardized open source tools for the community to ingest data, process data, and distribute data. So the idea here is to standardize and make this tooling easily available for data scientists, so typically people who don't have necessarily the knowledge of how to install the infrastructure behind it, and then they can start to build those data integration on their own. For data comparability, we use a data mesh architecture, which essentially means that we empower different data domain owners to solve the problem on their own in a distributed and federated way. So they can build their own pipeline ingesting data, processing data, distributing data in a fairly independent way. Uh, and they basically own data pretty much like a product. The last dimension is reliability. And so here, this is interesting because typically in distributed system, you get a lot of agility. But then the problem can be, how do you ensure that people follow a certain set of standards and also respect certain governance 
and security around data. So here we use a federated governance approach, uh, which pretty much is twofold. The first is we treat uh, a data very much like code. So we use uh, a processes that have been used in the open source community for years. So they are extremely well mature process, well proven to uh, manage and version code. We are extending this process to the data itself. So data sets are managed like code. They are transparently uh, generated. Everybody can see how the data is produced and shared. But at the same time, because there are certain governance issues around the data, we also manage access control and data governance in a central way across all the different domains. So this helps us to turn what I call a data mess into a data mesh. We have an extreme number of heterogeneous data source and data contributor. And instead of building yet another source or another database, what we do is we are actually standardizing the way uh, that people uh, now consume the data. We are federating across data source and we are standardizing the tooling and the approach to ingest, process, and distribute data. So I will now leave the next section to Eric to present on how we are actually using uh, open source uh, tooling to do this. And from the Red Hat perspective, uh, we are really building on an engagement, uh, which is actually an open source project that is called Open Data Hub. And Open Data Hub is really uh, uh, an AI platform powered by open source. So we are literally selecting multiple upstream projects in the open source community and putting together a platform that can easily be uh, deployed by data scientists across the globe uh, uh, you know, to build their own capabilities. Eric? Thanks, Vincent. Um, so yes, um, oh, I get to show my screen. Let's see. Sorry about that. I was expecting Vincent to drive. So, um, riffing off what Vincent said, um, there's a couple of things to say about Open Data Hub. One important thing is it's an open source downstream, in a very typical Red Hat-ish open source downstream way. Um, in this case, it's the downstream of Kubeflow. Um, and we're using it internally and externally as a reference architecture for um, machine learning workflows uh, on Kubernetes. Um, and, and lastly, it's federated, um, which to say that the, the actual components um, are selectable and uh, mixable. And also, um, just by virtue of uh, the Kubernetes and OpenShift platform, it's very easy to actually add other components uh, to the system if you want to. Um, the coverage of the uh, available tools uh, is actually quite good um, you know, in both dimensions in terms of process, all the way from business goals through uh, data preparation, model development, deployment, um, and then finally monitoring. And then along the axis of um, personas, it similarly covers um, use cases for people, um, you know, business leaders, uh, data engineering, data science, uh, all the way through like app development and operations. Um, I emphasized in this diagram a few of the tools you're going to see later today a uh, superset for uh, dashboarding and jupiter for both um, exploratory data science and also pipelining and then uh, trino which is a great example of the ad advantages of a federated architecture uh, trino is not actually a formalized component of open data hub but uh, it's being deployed in quite a lot of our uh, use cases, including uh, the data commons for OS Climate. Um, so again, uh, Open Data Hub is you know, leveraging everything that's good about open source, uh, community-driven upstreams, in this case, in the uh, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning workspaces. Um, we are 
maintaining the actual cluster using uh, another Red Hat affiliated project uh, called Operate First. And I'll show you a little bit more about what that means later. But fundamentally, what we're trying to do is take the popularity of uh, GitOps um, and extend that um, to whereas you know, open source has traditionally been excellent at accumulating knowledge about writing software. Um, we're trying to extend that into open source for accumulating knowledge in open communities about actually operating the same software. And so you're going to see that uh, um, the data commons is actually being managed uh, via operate first. Um, and so these two uh, tools are coming together into the uh, OS Climate Data Commons, which uh, Vincent has been describing. And again, I'll be demonstrating a few components of that later. And so the goal is to you know, be able to manage data as a product, just like we manage software as products. Um, and we're hoping that this architecture can, you know, show that we can service all the different use cases and personas, all the way from like raw data providers uh, to data engineering and structuring, and then to be able to actually do data science um, and maintain the quality of the results. Um, and we're trying to achieve this by treating data as code, just as well as we're treating data as software. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it means that you know we're federating very disparate data sources with repeatable pipelines you know that run in orchestrated cloud environments. And so what that means is if you want to update your data, you actually update the software that ingests it or processes it. And we're doing this all in open source. And so the entire community will be able to uh, participate and understand it exactly what software is being run, how it's being versioned, uh, and how it can be improved. And uh, I'll hand it back to uh, Vincent to I'll talk more about how we're uh, leveraging this uh, architecture. Yeah, thank you, Eric. All right. So uh, in terms of platform perspective, now looking at, uh, you know, a typical flow uh, and, and capabilities that are required in building, you know, data pipeline and, and what component of a data science platform are required. Um, as explained by Eric, we are leveraging heavily on, on Kubeflow as a machine learning platform. And it provides a number of, of components uh, that are, you know, used, uh, you know, in terms of building data pipeline, uh, model training and, and model deployment and serving. Uh, a lot of the work is done typically on Jupyter notebooks provided on a self-service basis in Jupyter Hub. Uh, both notebooks can be stitched together into end-to-end -end data pipeline, uh, you know, that, uh, that are using Elira. I'm going to think I'm on the wrong screen. Okay, that should be better. Sorry for that. Uh, and However, you know, we'll, we'll see later when I, when I cover this topic is there are still a number of components that we are trying to, to add to the platform to provide better manageability across the community. And these components are really around the management of experiment and data experiment, as well as the metadata associated with it. Uh, so we are now looking at project uh, Pachyderm as well as Data Hub from LinkedIn to uh, have a better automation around the metadata management uh, of all these data streams. So in terms of data science roadmap, uh, and please don't go into the detail here, this is really just to show that we do have currently a, a working platform and we have a number of streams in the West Climate community that are already building data pipelines for various data sets and, and data sources. However, we still have a lot of work to do, in particular in the, the, the domain of metadata management, 
and also trying as much as possible to automate some of the data uh, uh, catalog management. Uh, one of the big issues once you produce data from the community perspective is to make it discoverable. And really one of our uh, uh, objective in the month to come will be to try to create kind of catalog uh, uh, automatically for people to easily discover the data across the community. Now let's move to another set of problems and really more like the, the governance uh, side of things. Uh, here we are looking at different persona. Uh, typically, uh, one of the challenges for data engineer or data user uh, is the multitude of different data sources and the difficulty to merge them uh, and use them together to kind of make sense of the data. And typically, this needs to have a common referential to do so. Uh, so that's one kind of first problem here that we have to deal with. Now, the challenge though in this is a number of these like data sets that we consume uh, may be public, but others may be competitive data sets, so provided by a commercial data provider, which may be okay with the data being used to uh, uh, improve and tune certain uh, uh, data or risk model, but they're absolutely not okay with just distributing their data totally in the open. So they want security and compliance to be managed. So I've explained it before. What we're trying to, to, to do here is to create a single layer of compliance and security across the pipeline. So what this diagram shows uh, is basically a kind of very high level, uh, uh, you know, skeleton of what the data pipeline typically could look like. You have some primary source of data, which is nice, but not necessarily usable as it is by the community. And then you try to merge it with some kind of reference data set that will help people make sense of the data. So one example of this is, let's say you have carbon emission of, uh, you know, um, uh, factories in the United States. Now, you don't necessarily know which company actually owns this factory and how to actually aggregate all this data into a way that is meaningful for, say, an investor, which will be looking at those emissions uh, for specific, uh, you know, maybe public company, and also try to understand how these emissions relate to, say, the benchmark in the industry. So is this company doing well or not well? Yeah. Um, so so to, for, for this, what happens is there's a lot of the processing that is done to basically integrate data set together. But then when you integrate data set and that's, you know, once you reach like step number two in this diagram, you are basically building your own new data set with your data model and that needs to be documented. So the first thing that we're trying to do here is to build a catalog service that will keep track of data set version, data set metadata, and also what we call pipeline metadata, which is every time you generate uh, a new data set with a bit of code, you want to keep the code version and you want to associate the data that is produced with the latest version of your code. So people understand how the data set is actually uh, being uh, uh, built. As you do so, as you can imagine, a lot of data set get produced. Now, the, the question and challenge is, how do you make sure that when data needs to be governed and, and, you know, and, and some security access needs to be managed, we can do this consistently? So here, this is where a single layer of data federation and security based on Trino uh, uh, actually allows us to build a single uh, a logic of data access across multiple data sources. So right now, we are using Trino to do exactly this, to make sure that at the data element level, we have consistent security at any point of the pipeline. So let's say that some of this data, of this primary data set is actually commercial and is restricted in access. We can manage and make sure that the access is consistent on the primary data set layer, so the source data, but also when the data is distributed. So that is extremely important. So this is what we have today, but something that we are still working on is kind of going forward we want to be able to manage access at the data set, but also uh, at the metadata level. So, you know, 
taking certain like specific data set itself could be accessible to public. Uh, you know, one example of this is maybe you have a data set of data that is uh, not up to date. Maybe it's data from six months ago. You want to make it available to the public, but for the latest data, you need to have like a commercial licensing to do so. So you will use metadata tagging to basically tag your latest metadata set and make it subject to licensing. But then you have a public data set, which is kind of older data, just as an example. How do we make this happen? Is again, leveraging uh, an open source project uh, to build and integrate security and governance across three layers, which is the physical data layer. So how we, we store data and serve data, the virtual layer, which is how do we consume data? How do we query data uh, in the pipeline? And then the access layer, which is once data is ready to be distributed, how do you make it accessible by tools, by uh, data portals, and by different data users? A lot of what we built now is basically the first uh, three sub layers that you see at the bottom of this diagram. We use container storage technology based on Ceph for object storage. We use data serving, uh, relying on uh, Parquet and, and Apache Iceberg. So Apache Iceberg basically is a, is a big data format that gives us capability such as acid transactionality on the data itself, which means we have consistent uh, uh, you know, update and read of the data across big data set. And the underlying format is actually a parquet format, which makes it very uh, uh, scalable uh, to, to just add uh, you know, gigabytes or petabytes of data potentially. Uh, for specific data set. And on top of this, we are using Trino as a distributed SQL engine. So Trino helps us to federate uh, a query of data across a very high number of data sources. The work that we have not done yet is what you see above, building a metadata platform and some data security layer. We've, we are already experimenting with LinkedIn Data Hub project as well as Apache Ranger to build those layers. And, uh, a lot of the work that we are going to do in the next 12 months or so is going to be on those two layers. So that's really our roadmap for data access management. As you can see today, we have actually a very a granular access capability already with the Trino layer, and Eric will demonstrate this in the demo. But some of the things that we are missing is, is kind of how to tie the security to the metadata uh, management layer, and obviously how to generate catalog automatically. So let's go now into the demo, and then I will leave it you know, to Eric again to share his screen. Thanks, Vincent. I don't know if the moderator has to. Yeah, I've made you presenter. Oh, wait, there it goes. Um, perfect. Excellent. So um, I'm just going to briefly give you a high level view of what I'm about to try and demonstrate here. Um, as I mentioned before, um, we're intending to make heavy use of uh, Elira's capability of supporting um, Jupyter environments for both actual data exploration, data science, and prototyping. Um, but also to then take the same notebooks and be able to run them in repeatable pipelines and so sort of bridge the gap between actual data science um, and DevOps. And along the way, I'll show how we're using GitHub um, and some of uh, Red Hat's um, continuous integration bots, uh, as well as Quay. Um, and then similarly, you know, from the slide before, you know, Elira, we're hoping to represent actual repeatable ETL pipelines um, ingesting from um, disparate data sources, including things like uh, Object Store, um, then exposing these as actual SQL databases. And from SQL, you know, it's easy to consume um, through Jupyter or tools like Superset to do actual analysis. Um, so just briefly, um, 
all of this is being driven um, through the OS Climate uh, GitHub organization. Um, and we're making use of both uh, GitHub projects um, and teams. And this has been a, a real help, um, helping to onboard uh, different community members who, as Vincent mentioned, are not really conversant in open source. And so being able to give them a pathway um, to private repos on GitHub and then eventually to public repos has been uh, extremely successful and actually been very happy with uh, how much work now is being done uh, completely out in the open um, with the different uh, organization members. Um, and similarly, uh, I've had a lot of success unifying um, identity management through GitHub. So here you can see getting onto the actual cluster um, is done using GitHub. Um, and if you're a member of the organization with the correct team membership, uh, any, you can actually get on the cluster just by authenticating to GitHub. So here's the uh, Trino space. Um, most people don't get on the cluster unless they're cluster admins, of course, but it goes beyond that. Um, we also are um, logging into the Jupyter Hub environment itself using GitHub. So if I want to log back in, I have to click the same GitHub, and this is all letting me do this just by clicking a button because I've already authenticated to GitHub. Um, so the unified, the unified GitHub open authorization uh, has actually been quite nice in terms of cleaning up the uh, identity management. Um, and we've even got the uh, Trino access control working the same way. We have a, a JWT token server um, and to get onto that, you also have to uh, authenticate and it gives you a, a JWT token, um, no peeking. And um, here's where we've actually begun to already interact upstream. Um, so we want to unify um, Trino's group definitions with our GitHub team identities. And so I've been prototyping um, an actual Trino plugin that um, does group provision. Um, so it's actually extremely helpful. Um, and we're going to hopefully test this out and actually get it uh, upstream directly onto the main Trino repository. Um, I mentioned the operate first um, management. And so we're actually managing the entire cluster um, configuration through GitHub. And so here's just one example where I was actually resyncing our Trino user groups uh, with the GitHub teams. And it just took the form of a pull request. And in standard open source fashion, we discussed it and talked about a few alternatives. And then it was eventually merged. And now, um, you know, the new group configuration is automatically deployed on merge onto the cluster. So the operate first um, principles and the GitOps principles have been a definite uh, success. Um, so I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, how we're actually leveraging the platform, especially uh, sort of like one of the central, obviously, features is the Jupyter environment. Um, so obviously, you can do pip installs, but I already have these installed on the image. Um, we're managing actual credential storage with the uh, python.env, if you're familiar. It's basically a way you can load credentials without having it show up in the code. And of course, if you're storing your code, including notebooks up on GitHub, keeping your credentials out is extremely important. Um, so once you have these, you can connect uh, to the actual Trino data service. Um, we can do things like connect to uh, S3 buckets so using BOTO3. Um, so now let's look at some data. Um, here we have some implied temperatureize or ITR data that I'm loading straight off our Trino database. And its job is to map um, different investments. So these are different companies in the energy space or non-energy space as well that uh, you know, are associated with um, implied temperature rise success. And so over here in the far right, there is an achieved reduction targets. And so there are various points of progress achieving their targets. Um, 
And each of these is associated with a standard identification number, um, an ISIN or ISIN number. Um, and so we can make use of these keys to do some interesting things. Um, now, a completely separate data set contributed by the uh, Glyph organization um, provides some key data services like mapping these ISIN investment identifications to the um, legal entities that actually issued them. And so um, the legal entity identification or LEI number um, we're planning to leverage heavily um, as a community resource for uh, getting people to push their non-standard ways of tracking investments into standard ones. And I see that time is passing. So um, we also have a table that can map direct issuers, as you saw above, to ultimate parents. So this is to track um, corporations and corporation subsidiary ownerships so that um, you can actually do a better job tracking true climate impact up through company ownership chains. And so what if we wanted to take these three data sets, um, which come from two completely different organization members and get some kind of value out of it. So here I have a uh, SQL query, which maps the company names and their reduction progress uh, to the LEI legal identification and the legal identification of the parent. And so I could run this query. Um, and it gives me back a little pandas data frame. Um, and so you can see that by the time it's done with this joins, I get seven results. Um, the parents are all empty, which is to say these are all top level corporations. Um, and so the main, the main value here is that I've gone from standard investment ISIN numbers um, to a standardized L legal identification number to get the achieved reduction. Um, and of course, there's nothing special about the SQL. What's really special here is that we've already been able to federate data sets from two different community members to support you know, value add um, using standard data science techniques. Um, and so now suppose I wanted to like save this off. Um, I can run the same table and run the same query and I can save it off as an actual new SQL table. Um, there it is, that's the query. <clears throat> and it should tell me that it wrote seven records. Yes, so I got all seven records. Um, so now I've done some data science in a notebook. Um, again, what I told you is the, the Lyra Jupyter environment can do a lot of fancy things. Um, the fanciest thing it can do is you can take these notebooks. So I took, here's that notebook I just showed you, copied into um, a pipeline editor. And I can give it different dependency injections. Um, so what I can do is I can actually give it a new table name um, to output to for the pipeline. Make sure I save the pipeline. And then run it. I'm gonna use the Kubeflow pipelines, give it my demo config. And it gives me a link to the actual pipeline console. spinning up here. It'll give me an actual graph of the uh, pipeline node. There it goes. Um, so it's running. I can look at its log output, see what it's doing. So I want to stress that it's actually running the notebook I just showed you um, with exploratory data science and all. Um, and of course, you could remove some of that stuff to make things go faster. But uh, the main, you know, the main message is, it literally gives you a seamless transition from data science notebooks into repeatable pipelines. And it should shortly give me a message that it succeeded. Yes, the pipeline ran. 
Um, so now if I went back, I can actually convince myself that I got a new data table from running that. Um, here we go. So let's see. Everything went correctly. Yes. Um, so that pipeline reran that entire logic um, off on the system, and I got a new new table. Um, and we are at time. Um, I could try to demonstrate the. Let's see. We have time. Superset is not cooperating. Well, that's okay. We're at the end of time. I will um, close out the demo and hand it back to Vincent for uh, closing remarks. Uh, Eric, we still have a few minutes if you need to finish the uh, demo. Uh, let me try. Let me try one thing. I'll see if I can bring the link back up. Um, you need to share your screen again, Eric. Sorry. That's I okay. Are you seeing it? I think it's. Yeah, we can. yeah, excellent. Okay, well, let's see if I can get to the superset here. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so, um, you know, superset is another great open source tool for building um, sort of like low code or no code dashboards. Um, so, let's imagine I want to do a fast dashboard off of that data table that I just generated. Um, I have a predefined plot. And you can see here, I actually plotted the achieved reduction metric against company name and then sorted it in decreasing order. So you can see here that uh, you know, GlaxoSmith uh, has almost completed its uh, target reductions. And um, you know, some of the others aren't doing so great. Barclays, shame on you, um, I shouldn't say that. This is I'm sure they're doing fine. This data is just demo old data. Um, but anyway, there you can uh, see sort of like the entire pipeline from exploratory data science to repeatably executable pipelines through to actual uh, end user dashboarding and charting um, all on the same open source based platform. And Oh, I uh, want to show the actual image. So the uh, container image I used to run that pipeline um, was built um, also off of the OS climate repositories um, using Red Hat's continuous integration build robots. So here you can see I basically filed a GitHub issue saying, hey, could you please build me the latest image? It's version 0.1.1. And um, the bots went off and built that and put it up here on the Koi repository. So you can see here it was built yesterday, I think. Um, and then it came back and says, oh, I successfully built. So here's the link. And um, that was what I used to actually run this image. Um, and yes, that was actually the uh, completion. So now I can truly hand it off to Vincent. Thank you, Eric. So let me let me conclude maybe with some next step, you know, and, and reference links. You can find out more about the West Climate Initiative on the West Climate website under the Linux Foundation. The link is here for your reference. Uh, in terms of upstream projects, we have an open data hub community page that shows the architecture as well as the, the ongoing efforts integrating more open source projects. Uh, in the Open Data Hub initiative. Uh, and as you can probably infer from this presentation, we still have a lot of work uh, to make this happen with the community. And if any aspiring data scientist wants to 
work with us on the latest open source technology and, and become a contributor, don't hesitate at all to reach uh, you know, directly to us. I put actually my personal email out there as well as you can contact Eric. Uh, so don't hesitate to reach out. We are actively integrating community members now into this initiative. Thank you uh, everyone for your attention today.